but it was so quiet and like all you hear is literally the sound of your own footsteps mm. and breathing and it was just peaceful and um, I got to the bottom and like right at a mile um, the road turns and keeps going but straight ahead of you is this little beach and there's a picnic table and some trees and it's quiet and the sun's coming up behind me um, and I just sat down for a few minutes and just like sat and just kind of took it all in and I talked to God or Madame Pele or whoever was listening and I was just like I will give everything of me, not, not just physically, but everything. I will give my whole heart to this race in exchange for a safe passage. That's all that I wanted. I just wanted to get to the finish line in one piece <laughs> and just sat there and just appreciated everything that it had taken to get to this point. That was Mary Knott on the morning before realizing her Kona dreams. And this is the Yogi Triathlete Podcast. Hey everyone, I'm Jess. Welcome back to the show. This is episode 50 of the YTP. And today we have a total badass for you. We shared the mic with Mary Knott last November during our Arizona stopover of the Ride the High Vibe Tour. Mary had just completed her 21st Ironman on the big island after years of laser-focused vision, which brought her to the realization of her goal to qualify and compete at Ironman World Championships in Kona, Hawaii. With every minute of her day accounted for, Mary worked tirelessly on her physical and mental fitness. She rode the highs and fell deep into some lows, but she never gave up on her vision. This is a conversation about perseverance, about not backing off a dream and the acceptance that if we really want to attain a goal in life, we must remain 100% focused on pursuing its realization. This is a lesson that doesn't just apply to triathlon. It's for every goal in life. We're so good at getting distracted from what it is we dream of by buying into excuses or finding something else that we also want to do when really It's the laser focus and only that, that will get us to where we want to go. And that's what Mary did. This girl went all in. She understood that in order to wrangle this dream into reality, she had to put it all out there. And in October of 2013, she changed the name of her blog, along with all of her social media handles to align with her Kona goal. So many times we keep our goals to ourselves. I think it's partly because we fear we may fail. We believe that on some level that we're not worthy or good enough to achieve them. And by putting them out there, it ups the accountability and it leaves little room for acceptable excuses. Now that said, I also believe that it's important to take time to nurture our goals within ourselves, to make sure that we are clear on our why especially when they're young. Some people like to write them down, and whatever the process is that works for you, understand that it all gives the vision life. I think that this private time with our goals is so important. I know that BJ and I took about four months of building the energy around our Ride the High Vibe tour before telling anyone. We knew that there would be naysayers and questions, and we wanted to make sure that we were completely grounded and clear in our mission that nothing would sway us. And when the time was right, we made it public. And this is exactly what Mary did. She took her dream and gave it a name, Finding Kona. This conversation will surely satisfy your triathlon pleasure centers, your goal-attaining motivational needs, and most definitely, it will give you a clear understanding of what it takes. Thank you everyone for tuning into the show. If you haven't checked out our Patreon page, please do because it's the spot where you guys, for as little as a few bucks a month, can help us keep the YTP alive. We are in deep thanks. I'm serious. We are in deep thanks to each of you for your support and for the messages that you send us. It would be hard to articulate how timely they are, but what I can say is that 
They keep us committed to providing you with quality content every week from people who are looking, finding, and living their purpose. Mary Knott is absolutely on this track. She is a person who can hold a one-pointed focus for a long period of time, and to me, that makes her the perfect endurance athlete. Stay tuned and listen to the outro for more details on what Mary reveals to us at the end of our conversation. So sit back and get comfy because you are about to plug into the inspiring journey of finding Kona. It's so cool though. The progression of life is so cool. All right, well, let's jump in and let's talk about what you love. Let's talk about triathlon. (laughs) Um, You just finished Kona, the world championship, which in this moment, I don't know if you can see, but my, my eyes are welling up because I followed your journey and you were there at my first Ironman, which was 2008 in Coeur d'Alene. And that's where we met. Yep. And we were connected through Nicole de Boom, Skirt Sports. We were Skirt Sports ambassadors. Yep. We were like the first, <laughs> the first like early adopters of Skirt Sports. And what number Ironman was that for you? Because it was alone. It was low. Like you hadn't done a ton. That would have been number three. Number three. Yep. And since 2008, you have done, what's your total now? Uh, Kona was 21. 21. Yep. When did the Kona dream come in? You know, ironically, so my husband has raced in Kona twice. And the first time was in 2009. And I was training for Arizona. So I took my bike and I did my long ride on the Queen K, which was supposed to be 100 miles. It ended up being like the worst 75 miles I've ever (laughs) ridden in my whole life. It was absolutely miserable. Um, And I got back to the hotel and I just like collapsed into a pile on the floor. And I looked at Dan and I was like, I do not ever want to race here. And this is like two days before he's about to race it for the first time. And he's just like looking at me with just absolute panic on his face. (laughs) I... I'm going to stop you there for one second because one of my favorite things in this world is when we say, I will never. Yeah. Oh, yeah. That I don't back ever. To my, I, I will never. I have learned not to say that because yeah. everything I've sworn I would never do, I eventually do. Yeah. So. And then two years later, he raced again for the second time in 2011. And same thing. I had a bike and um, did some riding. And at that time, you know, I had grown a lot as an athlete and gotten a little bit stronger. And I kind of thought, you know this is something that I I think I could do. And um, at that time, I wasn't super fast. I was still kind of like mid-pack. And so I set my eyes on the legacy. Um, I don't, I I maybe had like eight Ironman at that time or something. So I needed four more um, to qualify for the legacy lottery. And in that process of accumulating legacy slots, I had just a breakthrough race at Arizona in 2012. And I finished in 10 hours and 54 minutes. And I think, I I don't remember exactly, but I might have been sixth in my age group. Generally, they have about two slots. But that was close enough for me to say, I have to do this for real. I have to give myself that chance or I'll just never know. Um, So at that time, even though I had 12, I was like, I'm not going to apply to the lottery. I'm just going to work as hard as I can. And see where this goes. <laughs> so at that time, were you being coached by anyone? No. And why was that a breakthrough race? Well, it was first, my first time under 11 hours. Um, my previous best on that course was 11.58, I think. So it was wow. like, quite a big, it was, big PR. Yeah. Huge. Big PR in a fast course. Yeah. Yeah. So, you know, I think it was just at, at that point, it was just accumulation of a lot of consistent work. We started in the sport in 2005. And um, have been doing Ironman since 2007. So it was just accumulation of hard work. But that I, I was just self-coached at that point. And still then even for another year. Um, and then when I raced Arizona in 2013, I sort of had plateaued. It was like 1102 or something. So it was still in that ballpark, but I didn't improve. And that's when I signed on with Hillary. Hilary Biscay, the yes. Iron Man queen. <laughs> Iron Man queen, Smash Fest queen. We love her. Um, now, did you know Hillary prior to? Yeah, we actually had met her. Well, Dan says, actually, that we met her in transition at our very first triathlon. Um, so our very first triathlon was um, SOMA, which is mm-hmm. now Ironman Arizona 70.3. 
Um, but it was local race at that time, SOMA. Um, it's in October, and it was 20, 2005. And we were in transition, our very first race. We were so excited, had no clue what we were doing. Um, <laughs> ignorance is bliss. Ignorance is bliss. <laughs> and uh, we wanted a, a photo. And he, he looked around and Hillary was standing there. We had no idea who she was. And he was like, hey, would you mind taking a photo of us? <laughs> she was like, sure. So she like took this photo of us. And then we like see her on the podium <laughs> later that day. We were like, Oh my God. <laughs> I think she must be somebody. Yeah, she must be somebody. So <laughs> that's so funny. Yeah. So, full circle 2005 to 2013. Yeah. So, that end of 2013, I started with her January of 2014. Awesome. And why Hillary? Gosh, so many reasons. She is a fighter. She's so strong and talented, but just tough as nails. And she's not one of those people that walked into the sport and was just handed everything that she wanted on a silver platter. She worked her ass off for every single thing that she got. And I could, that's somebody that I can relate to, somebody that I know is going to push me to be my best and never settle for anything less. And um, when we sat down to kind of talk about how we were going to, you know, basically have the coaching relationship, I asked her point blank. I was like, look, this is my goal. Here's my numbers. Here's where I'm at. Is this realistic? And she said, absolutely. So, you know, it was kind of a no brainer. And what has the last few years looked like when <laughs> she signed on with her? How has like the training experience changed? From going self-coach to really who I consider to be one of the best in the field. Yeah. Um, you know, it's just – it's a lot smarter training, um, and that's been the biggest thing. I mean, it's hard work, um, but she is absolutely brilliant with recovery. And whereas before when I was self-coached and I had this plan and I would, like, stress over every single – you know, if I couldn't fit – the workout in on the schedule that it was given, you know, I would freak out about having to miss something or try to squeeze it in the next day. And you're just like doing stuff that doesn't make any sense whatsoever. And so many people who, this is what I think is the importance of a coach because so many people do that. They try and make up a workout. Yeah. And I think in Ironman, you can adjust if it's, if it's key, you can adjust, you can be flexible, but making it up yeah. on top of everything else is, I, I would say, one of the biggest. What yeah, do you think, the, BJ? Yeah, there's, you're a coach. Re there's a reason why Tuesday is this workout and yeah. Thursday is this workout. <laughs> if you don't get Tuesday, don't try and move it to Wednesday and then do Thursday's workout. Like, there's a reason and purpose for every workout. Yeah, exactly. And you need that recovery. And a coach can help guide you a little bit just to be that outside voice that says, no, you're okay. Yeah. You're where you are. You're okay. Like, you're fit. It's okay. Yeah. Like, you can skip a workout or move it here. <laughs> and I think people really need to hear that a lot. Yeah. Otherwise, they're going to bury themselves. Exactly. And it's probably yeah. what you did. And I, I you know, I, I can speak to it, too. Like, you just take your own plan into your hands and you just, you dive into it. And you're yep. like, I need to do more. Volume, 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 intensity, intensity. And it sounds like Hillary kind of pointed out the recovery aspect of things like yeah. stress, recover and adapt. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. And it's been it's been huge. I mean, she obviously she knows my work schedule. So she has that in front of her when she's making my plan. And I work 40 hours a week at the real job. I work an additional maybe 10 to 20 at at Cadence Running Company. And then I am like, I guard my sleep with everything. So I am eight hours a night, period. <laughs> um, so she can take the rest of those hours and, you know, create this amazing plan that works. So what did your training load look like? Because you are you are not laying around on the couch doing <laughs> no. nothing. You are busy. So here is another no excuses, people. No excuses, right? We've we've had so many people on there doing these amazing things and they're, you know, maybe they've got a family and they're working full time and then they're doing other things and it's like you can always make it work. Yeah. So how did how did what did your volume look like as far as hours look like in a week? I would say I top out at like peak Ironman training, I top out somewhere between 
maybe 18 and 20. And and more like on an average weekly basis, it's probably closer to like 12 to 15. And, and weekends then, are big? Um, actually, so I work um, every other Saturday, a full day. So um, the way that my, my paying job um, is set up, I work four days in a row. I have Sunday off. I work four more days in a row. And then I have five days off. So in that five-day block, we put in just a massive amount mm-hmm. of work. And then when I'm when I'm working, I generally have like a couple of hours in the morning that she can work with and lots of like I, I have learned to love the trainer because you can just do massive amounts of work in a shorter period of time. Like 90 minutes, I can be like dead for a day. <laughs> um, so you can just really just kill yourself on the trainer. And I've learned to appreciate that. Yeah, we love the trainer. I think we, the trainer gets a bad rap. It does. I it love does. the trainer, like really quality work. So it seems to me that not only having Hillary to work with just that very irregular training mm-hmm. schedule, yeah. but it was a lot of, was it a lot of specificity? Yes, yes. So really targeted workouts, like, and you like BJ said, like very much a purpose for each workout. Absolutely. Not a lot of junk mile, quote unquote, yep. junk miles or anything like that. Now you mentioned recovery, that Hillary is great at recovery. How mm-hmm. did your recovery change? I, I don't have like days off just because I w- would probably kill someone. Um, <laughs> I need those endorphins, but my recovery days. <laughs> Love it. Serving multiple life sentences. Yes. Yeah, that's what I always say. I'd probably be serving multiple life sen- sentences if it wasn't for triathlon and yoga. <laughs> um, but but really, I mean, like swimming will be built in. Um, so I'll have like tomorrow. I t- Today is like a really hard day. Um, so tomorrow all I have is a 5K super easy swim. And I know like my husband would say 5K is not a recovery swim, but it honestly is like – I enjoy swimming and it's just, you know, it'll be like an hour and 15 minutes in the pool, just totally relaxed and, and having a good time. Active recovery. Active recovery. Yep. You want to speak to that? Like active recovery versus sitting on the couch and taking a day off? I I also don't, I rarely give days off because I want the, I can't tell you how you're going to feel or, you know, I'm going to give Sunday off, but when does if you feel good on Sunday? Yeah. Why would I hold you back? So I like the people to get out there and actually do something, whether it's swimming, biking, yoga, walking. Yep. Just get out there and move. I rarely give anybody a complete day off where they yeah. sit on the couch, maybe during taper week yeah. um, into, into a race. But keeping it moving keeps things firing. And, and for you, it seems yeah. like you need to have that focus to just to keep Absolutely. keep going or else someone's going to pay for it. And not, I mean, not just emotionally, but um, physically. I mean, as I've gotten older, I notice that like if I sit on the couch all day, like everything tightens up and I feel miserable. So I would rather be out, you know, doing something, an easy jog or. Yeah. And consistency. Swimming. Like that's another thing, like just consistently be out there doing yep. something. I've, if you're going to skip a workout, at least get out there and walk. Yeah. Just do that. So from the time that you said, all right, I'm going to do this thing, like I'm going to, I'm going to call it, this is, this is how BJ is too. He's like, if I'm going to do it, I'm doing it from, you know, getting a spot at a race, you know, being that person who gets the spot allocation. What did the races look like between that? Hmm. Between you saying, this is what I'm going to do and you running down a Leahy drive. Oh, Because I know you had some (laughs) ups and downs. I did. You know, honestly, um, so when I started with Hillary, so I started with her January of 2014. And in August that year, um, I got a power tap. And let me tell you, that made all the difference in my bike training. Because apparently, I was the type of person that in training would just like not soft pedal, but I wasn't really pushing myself in training. But yet on race day, I would absolutely go out and crush myself. I mean, I was way outperforming on race day, the level that I had trained to. And that's probably why I never had a very good run. Oh, absolutely. So getting that power tap, and then being able to incorporate um, really hard bike training made a lot of difference. And we did so that that winter, um, I did what Hillary calls bike camp. Um, so I spent like a couple of months just killing myself on the bike. And not not all hard workouts, but long, 
easy rides and long intervals and short intervals and just, I mean, like, I think I was doing like 300 miles a week on the bike. And and the swim and the run, you know, had to take a back seat. I was still doing those things, but we were definitely focused on the bike. And that made a, a huge impact in how I could come off the bike and run. And I think from the outside, I have been doing like three to four Ironman races a year for the past, I'm going to say, four to five years, four years maybe. And from the outside, I think a lot of times it looked like like it was too much. But when you look at it from the inside and from from my training logs and and from Hillary and I's perspective, um, we were making improvements every single day. And at any one of those races in 2015, I had the potential to qualify. And you got really close a few times. I got really – oh, gosh. You like, got really close in Arizona, Lake right? Placid oh, Lake Placid was yes. absolutely devastating because I was ninth female and I was sixth in my age group. I mean, h- how does that happen? It's just – an amazing group of women. I mean, you're just, you're competing against the best. Is that the first time you had done that race? Lake yes, Placid? Yes. Yeah. So we were there. And, and, <laughs> oh, yeah. Yeah. yeah we, we were there. there yeah. We were all there together. What'd you think about that race? Oh my God. I loved it. <laughs> it, it loved it's it. like my favorite. Yeah. It's such a beast. The finish too is. I it's love. such a beast. But for some reason I can, I can run that, I can run on that course. Yeah. Which makes no sense after that bike. So hilly. It's so hilly. I love, what I loved most about Lake Placid, and I think I I got the same vibe in um, Kona as well. It's almost, the whole, when, you, when you get there, it's just magical. I mean, there is just this, this spiritual, it's incredible. I can't even, I can't, I can't even describe it. I mean, just the whole town is, it's quiet and it's this Olympic town. So it has this like feeling of, you know, excellence. Something it does. Great Something there, great yeah. happened there. Mm-hmm. And you can just, you just feel that with like everything. And so it was just, and, and to have like the finish line where the Olympic torch is lit and yeah, um, it's such a beautiful. It's a magnificent race. When you turn into that oval, my favorite thing is turning into the oval and looking up at the legends of the oval. Yeah. And you're just, you just got to soak it up. Yes. You know, you just got to <laughs> soak it up and you're just, it's it's a town that is just steeped in um, athletic performance. Yeah. You know, the best of the best. Yeah. So you placed sixth in your age group. How many, how did you, how many, like by how many people did you miss a spot? I think there was only two. So I'm, you know, I missed it by four. It wasn't. And how did you fail after that? Was there a disappointment? Was there a downturn? Like, how do you, when you're going for it and you're so close and you don't get it, is there a <laughs> moment of, oh my God, am I ever going to get it? You know, um, there was, well, okay. So after Lake Placid, like literally on my drive home or flight home, I was like, I can't wait for Arizona. Like I need to do something else. And so I talked to Hillary and I was like, Lake Tahoe is open still. Like I want to, I want to race again. And she was like, that's great. That's a, I think that's fine. We have enough time. You know, it's, you've still got enough time to recover before Arizona. Let's do Lake Tahoe. And um, I think I don't know what was different about Lake Tahoe. I think I had just put a lot of pressure on myself. And I think I, when I looked at the list, um, first of all, there was only a thousand athletes total racing. Not even that. I think when I looked at the list, there might have been 800 people registered for the Ironman. And um, there were not very many women in my age group. And so I thought, I really have a chance. Like I, I came so close in Lake Placid. Yeah. Like this is it. Like this is this is going to be and the this one. This is the unexpected one. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> well, then it turned out. I guess there was probably a few other women who had the same idea <laughs> because <laughs> when I showed up race week, um, there were people you could you could register at the race, and wow. there were some amazing women that like showed up and registered, and I was like, oh no. And, you know, honestly, it was fine because I didn't have a great race in Lake Tahoe. I completely fell apart on the run. Just, I think I got really dehydrated. I can't remember. 
Um, but I, I, I had to stop at the your... and be evaluated by medical at yeah. like mile 13 or something like that. So I remember reading your race <laughs> report and I think there was some tears. Oh, yeah, there was a lot of tears. Yeah, so we'll look back and we'll find these race reports from the races we're talking we'll about look, and we'll, we'll link to them. So yeah, people can oh, yeah. really yeah. catch up on your journey. Um, it was so cool to to watch from the sidelines and cheer for you and then see oh my god what's happening on I know, the run I know what's happening on the run Every, everyone was it. like where is she like she's not crossing timing mats anymore something has happened <laughs> um but you know after Lake Tahoe I really I had been struggling with some anxiety prior to Lake Tahoe kind of hit me at the beginning of September and then after that I really like I really had like a bad couple of months um if you read the blog, you probably saw, but I just, I mean, I, I have a history of depression and anxiety and for whatever reason, it just like started up at the beginning of September, completely unrelated to triathlon. It was um, some stuff going on in my personal life, but it, you know, obviously that impacts everything. And it was like, I literally could not eat for like a month and I lost 10 pounds. And I was like, how the hell am I going to race Arizona if I'm like, have no energy? Um, so I started seeing a therapist like immediately and she's wonderful and got me straightened out. But that was really the only time where I was like, started to have doubts, like, is this ever going to happen? Um, and ironically, at that time, Hillary had done a podcast with somebody, and I can't remember who it was, but in the podcast, she talks about um, how obsession with a goal can be like detrimental because you're limiting how well you can perform. And so I called her up and I was like, actually, I sent, I think I sent her like a super long email and I'm the type of person that can focus on something for an extremely long period of time. I told my family I was going to be a vet when I was like six years old. And it was like an obsession until I got accepted, which was like age 19. So that's like 13 years of focusing. And literally, like, I know that that's kind of hard to believe, but like literally when you're like, 13 and 14 years old and you're going, what can I do to make sure that this is working towards my dream? And I would go and volunteer at my vet's office and I would, you know, make sure I was doing community service hours. So I would get into the school that I wanted to do. And just like every single thing was focused on that goal. Um, and so I wanted her to know that, um, that I was committed for the long term, um, no matter how long it took. Um, that I was committed. If it didn't happen this year, it didn't happen. And I was going to be okay with that. We were still going to keep working. But I told her that for Arizona, I wasn't going to think about Kona. You know, basically, she was like, I think that's a fabulous idea. Let's just see how fast you can go. Yeah, I remember <laughs> the switch. I remember the switch that and it, it felt that you just lifted all that pressure. Yeah. But had you not gone so low, I don't know that would I would have happened. Yeah, and I don't think so. Yeah, I think that I think it took that um, for me to to yeah to make the change mentally. So sort of detaching yet still yeah pursuing the end goal exactly, but not be so tied to it. Yeah, but being tied to it, so <laughs> it's like finding that balance, right? Because yeah. you still want to pursue it. Yeah, and you had the drive to pursue it, but investing everything into it just sort of came to a point where you had to take a step back. Yep. yep. And you had a great race. Oh my God. I had the perfect race. <laughs> so letting go. Yes. <laughs> Let's hear about that perfect race. <laughs> Let's hear about that perfect race. So, so you had this conversation with her and, and she just said, all right, let's just see how fast you can go. And yeah. when she said that to you, what kind of permission did that give you? Um, it just lifted you know, I, I live in a, a pretty small bubble. Um, I don't train with a lot of people. Um, a few, I have a few girlfriends that will train together and push each other. Um, and then obviously Dan does, you know, we'll, we don't have the same workouts, but um, sometimes we'll have like bike rides on the same day. So um, other than that, like I don't, I try not to listen to the negativity and thank 
thankfully, there's been way more positivity than negativity. But there are some people along the way that have said, you're racing too much. You can't do this. You're doing it wrong. The naysayers. The naysayers. Yeah. yeah. And that's their perception. That's their... Yeah, yeah. we talked about... We had yeah. did a podcast last night talking about this idea of perspective. Yeah. So before we go further into this perfect race in Arizona, how do you, how do you move through the naysayers? I really... I really mostly just had to like block it out of my mind. I'm not the person that um, when you tell me I can't do something, I'm not the person that's like, oh, I'm going to show you. Like that's there. There are a lot of people. My husband is like that. Like if someone tells him he can't do something, he's damn well going to prove him wrong. Um, and that's just that doesn't motivate me. <laughs> um, I think I'm a little more internally motivated, so I just had to block everything out. But a couple weeks before Arizona, um, we were laying in bed one night and just talking. And Dan was like, you are absolutely going to destroy this course. He's like, I cannot wait to see, like, the reaction. (laughs) And I remember thinking, like, when I came off the bike, I was like, oh, my God, he was right. (laughs) All right. Well, take us through that day then. So let's go. Let's go to the swim. Because you're um, you're a great swimmer. Yeah, yeah. Um, so the swim, it was the first year for the kind of like rolling start for Arizona. We've always had a mass start. So last year was the first year that we didn't. And it was interesting. I lined up like like literally in the front row. So um, Is it a self-seated, like you're basing yeah. your time? Or is it just when you show up, you get to get in line? They well, they recommend that you self seed, but it's not like it's not like at Coeur d'Alene where they set up the um the time the banners yes. yeah okay and, and then do, you get behind that, that and, then, like and they like let a bunch of people in at once it, in arizona you're actually running down bleachers to get into the water so they're literally letting you in like um i think there's like four steps wide so th- you're literally jumping in four people at a time and people are like pushing from the back oh yeah <laughs> i love the i love the treachery of the start oh my god a really treacherous start in cozumel last year when the dock collapsed and, <sighs> Like, it's just so funny. Before your day even starts, you have to do this. It's so much more yeah. than swim, bike, and run. It's like, get, get from the land right. to the <laughs> yeah. water safely, yeah. you know? Yeah, try not to drown. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so you're in the front. Uh, so I was in the front, and um, I I actually – so I have a, a side that I like to be on in Arizona. I, I am a really good swimmer, but ironically, I have, like – I've had panic attacks in the water, so I would prefer just not to be touched – in the water, so um, an, e- an easy goal at an yeah. Ironman. Yeah, that's, so that's easy. Like, <laughs> <laughs> my coach is like, "So, did you find some good feet to draft off of?" I was like, "Oh no, here's me over here by myself swimming." <laughs> yeah. So, how do you manage that? Do you just go wide? I do. Yeah. 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 And then cut in when you have to. Yeah. Make the turn back. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. Um, and usually by like Arizona's one loop, so usually by the time I turn around at the far end of the lake, there's not too many people, so I can then ride the buoy line on the way back. Um, but for me, I can swim faster if I'm not thinking about getting punched, and if I'm not in a pack where there's just like arms flailing and you're having to chop your stroke. Yeah, and you just can't. It's like those four people around you, yeah. and you're in a pod. That's like you. It's like you're you all like in an yeah. egg yeah. or something. Like yeah. you cannot get out. Yeah. So mass start, rolling start. It doesn't matter. Like no. there's still the availability for a lot of contact. Oh, absolutely. Yeah. But like what you do for anyone that's you know is nervous about the swim, or maybe that's something that's preventing somebody from signing up. There's always a way to find your water. Oh, absolutely. Always absolutely. a way. I've never, I, knock on wood, I've never not found clear water when I needed it. So, Okay. So you're, you're cruising the buoy line? <laughs> yeah. On the way back. <laughs> on the way back, yep. <laughs> and I, I think I was like 58 minutes out of the water or something like that, which was fine. Um, and I tend to have pretty good transitions. But when I got on the bike... I actually, in the first like eight miles, when you're working your way out to the beeline, passed a couple of pro women. And I was like, well, that's interesting. But, you know, there's always a lot of like first year pros that come and race Arizona Mm -hmm. um, for the experience. And um, I kept waiting. I didn't know where I was at in the in the field, in the amateur field. But I know there's like um, a bunch of super strong cyclists here in the valley. Um, So when I race Arizona, I just like wait for them to catch up to me. 
because then I like kind of have a sense of like where I'm at and um, then I will just like work as hard as I can just to keep them like in sight. Um, so it's always been the goal. And last year, like I kept waiting and waiting and waiting and I never like never saw anybody. I was like, okay, well, whatever. I'm having a really good day. And um, I came off the bike and a friend of mine was spectating standing just outside of transition and I went running out and she's like you're first overall and I was like (laughs) what (laughs) and I have just like never been so excited in my whole life I mean like obviously I didn't have the fastest bike time of the day but I had the fastest swim bike combination and to come off the bike first and like that was just like the most incredible thing. And you ever. see all the bikes in transition. <laughs> yeah. Like you're, oh, you know, you no, don't see like anything. Nobody. You're there the first like some men, you know. <laughs> um, and Hillary was at like mile one on the course. She was underneath a bridge, like by rural. And I come running by and she was like, oh my God. I was like, yeah, I guess somebody fucking learned how to ride a bike. <laughs> <laughs> but it, why do I feel like Hillary the whole time was kind of like had a smile being like even in those months like leading up right. to and going oh she's yeah. gonna crush it yeah 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 I feel like her and Dan had secret conversations yeah <laughs> so, all right so you're on the run tell us about the run it was oh it was just the coolest thing ever so a couple of weeks prior to Arizona I had done this training um training day with my group of friends. And um, we had a four hour bike ride with some intervals followed by a two hour run at race pace. And um, on that day, on that training day, um, this friend of mine and I literally ran step by step the entire two hours. And we kind of joked, we were like, oh, wouldn't it be fun if we were like ran together on race day? Well, he caught up to me We came off the bike like pretty similar. I don't remember. I may have beat him out of transition just because the men's transition tends to be a little bit crowded. So anyway, at some point, like we caught up to each other, like right around mile four. And we like literally ran together until mile 18. (laughs) And so it was fun to have. I mean, we like didn't talk to each other. We're both like dying. But, you know, we were kind of like back and forth and not necessarily like side by side, but just like having him there it was comforting. Yeah. Um, it, like there doesn't need to be words no. to have it be really powerful and supportive. Yeah. Yeah. Wow. Just like, okay, I'm not alone. We're holding our pace. Mm-hmm. We're like doing a great job. And I was like, this is this is good. And then um, at mile 18, I knew at that point because the two girls um, who finished first and second had already passed me. So I was in third. And Overall. In my age group. So – I knew I was in third and I kept, you know, I ha- we, we have so many like friends and everybody like out on the, the course and everybody's like trying to like tell me where the girl in fourth is behind me. And I have uh, a friend that was out there and she was like at like mile 18, she was like, you've got to go now. Like she's like, like a minute back, you've got to go. I was like, oh, fuck. Like, I was expecting to, like, hold back until, like, maybe the last 10K. I was like, well, it's now or never. So, like, at at mile 18, I, like, put the hammer down, and um, I ended up finishing, like, 20 minutes ahead of my friend. (laughs) (laughs) I think after I left him, he was like, oh, fuck it. You know, I don't care anymore. (laughs) But um, I just, like, gave it everything I had that last eight miles. And there's a, a part of the course Um, with about like you come into this aid station underneath this bridge and you come around the corner and there's like maybe like three miles to go and I was just like so focused and running scared I caught my husband at that point and he like reached out to like high five me or something and I like didn't even like acknowledge him (laughs) you're in the zone (laughs) I was like I can't like I can't even expend that energy to like high five you right now um, and Hillary was there and she was shouting something at me. And I, I honestly, I don't remember what she was shouting at me, but what I heard in my head was her words from the year before, which was, you always have another gear. Um, she had, she had told me that on the run course in 2014, um, you always have another gear. And that's what I heard 
that's not what she was yelling at me, but that's what I heard um, when I ran past her. And I got behind this guy who was like running the pace I needed to run. Um, and I followed him for like a mile, just like staring at the back of his jersey. And then I was just like, I was convinced that fourth place was closing in on me. And she wasn't. Um, but in my head, she was. And I was just not going to leave anything to chance. <laughs> in those moments, are you, are you, so you've got eight, at mile 18, do you start ticking off the miles? Are you like, I need to get to mile 19? And take the mile 20. Like, what is going on? What was going on in your mind at the at that moment? <laughs> like, are you there or are you like, is your mind going? Oh, no. I try to stay like very present in the moment and like, what do I need now? And it's really easy with like when you're like in that running scared, it's really easy to neglect everything that you need to be doing. But you still have eight miles to go. And if you skip an aid station or if you don't take in enough calories, you're not going to make it. Um, so it was literally like, get to the next aid station as fast as you can. You need this, 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 and this. And like, go. Keep moving. So you, <laughs> yeah. weren't, you weren't walking the aid stations. Oh, you... <laughs> no, no, no. There's no walking <laughs> grab aid stations. This, grab that, pour it over your head, go. Yeah. 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 Okay. yeah. But you have to like be prepared because, you know, the volunteers are wonderful, but they're like, you know... They're kind of like looking around and enjoying the They're day. They're not running and... scared for a Kona qualification. No, no, right, no. So you're like, I need this. <laughs> so I have a question similar to BJ's, but a little different language. Are you thinking at this point, Kona, Kona, Kona? Or are you thinking no. at this point, just go, just see how fast you can go. Just race as fast as you can go. I just didn't want to let go of third. That was, that was it. I was not thinking. It, I thought, like in my head, I thought there was only going to be two Kona slots and it, you know, like at that point, I was like, well, maybe there will be a roll down, but I'm not letting go of third. I mean, I guess it would be it would be a lie probably to say that I wasn't thinking about Kona a little bit, um, especially like when I was holding on to third, um, because I knew that there would nothing there would there would never be a fourth. I couldn't finish fourth and qualify. So when I when the two women had passed me earlier in the race and I was in third, it was like, okay, the, you you cannot let go of third, no matter what. So when you crossed that finish line and you didn't know at that point if you had qualified or not, did you feel like you had put it out there like you never had before? Yes. And I mean, I, I think I like cried for like two days. <laughs> <laughs> Hillary was there at the finish line and I literally like ran into her arms and we were both just like sobbing. I never dreamed in a million years that I would go 10.09. I mean, I thought I thought I would go like 10.30. Like I would take 20 minutes off and it would be a huge PR. Like to go 10.09, I just, it was beyond my wildest dreams. So it was still, they only had two slots listed for my age group. And so I was like, well, you know, again, there could be like a roll down or whatever, but I'm not counting on it. Um, but I told Hillary, I was like, no matter what happens, like, this potential has been unlocked. So now I know that no matter what, it will happen. You were, you were, like, you were equipped to walk away being like, yes, that was the best race of my life. That was the best of, race of my life. So how did that race get better? <laughs> what happened next? What did you find out the next day? So the next day we went and apparently – they have like a list that you can go and like talk to um, somebody in the morning and like find out. But what's published after you finish, so like that night we went and, and like wh whoever had the list, it was listed as two slots. I didn't know this, but I guess Hillary or my husband or maybe both of them had gone over and realized that some woman in the uh, I don't remember if she was 60, 60 to 64 or 65 to 69, missed finishing by like literally like a couple of minutes. And so I got her slot. <laughs> oh, thank you so much, <laughs> yeah. lady friend. Because it's predetermined where, if there's extra spots, the, the yeah. order of where it will be allocated could go to another age group. But in this instance, yeah. it was it was mine. your age group. Yeah, because I think the, the women 40 to 44 had a bigger age group. 
but they already had three slots. Mm -hmm. So the extra one went to mine at the time I was in 35 to 39. Uh, But they didn't tell me, um, Hillary and Dan, they didn't like mention a word because I don't don't know if it was just like not official yet or like they didn't want to get my hopes up or whatever it was. But so we're standing there at roll down and ironically, like when they were calling my age group, I had another friend who's like, talking to me and she's like chit-chatting 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 and so I actually missed the first part of Mike Griley announcing that I was going to get to go (laughs) oh my gosh (laughs) Uh, and she's talking and the next thing I know Hillary is like well everyone around me is like screaming and Hillary grabs my arm and then I like look up and then he calls my name and I was like oh my god (laughs) you're going to Kona yeah (laughs) And again, like tears, like crying. I was like, seriously, yeah, it was just. <laughs> so during, I just want to backtrack just a little bit. Did you have a watch when you were at this race? Were you watching your time and heart oh, yeah. rate and all that? Okay, yeah, yeah. Okay, definitely. so you kind of you kind of knew your time. Mm-hmm. And the and your bike ride. Do you think your bike is <laughs> is the thing that like really like? Yeah, I do. Pushed you like. Yeah. Not only did I have a great bike time, I got off the bike in five hours and 12 minutes, which was uh, my fastest by like right around 20 minutes. Wow. That's huge. Um, Yeah. But just having done so much work on the bike, then I could get off and run the marathon that I knew I could run. And what was that? Mar- was that marathon time faster than your normal? Yeah. Um, I ran a 353 and my previous best was like well over four hours. Wow. So everything everything came together. Like everything came together for you. Mm-hmm. And then everything outside of you came together with that spot getting put into your age group. Yeah. Like that's what it takes. <laughs> it takes that absolute perfect recipe yeah. to get to Kona. It did, yeah. All right, should we talk about Kona? Let's talk about Kona. All right, let's talk about Kona. One more what? question. Yeah. We can't about wait. Um, be- <laughs> about before, the bike. before you were using PowerTap, were you based on heart rate your own? or um, spe- Yeah. Not not heart rate, but just like perceived exertion, Perceived I guess. exertion. Yeah. Okay. So um, it was kind of a big shift to go huge... from like nothing to like power and yeah. then know your watts as you're training and needed to target these watts yeah. consistently. Okay. And I yeah. think it's, it's really hard to go by perceived exertion. And even like a lot of people will like watch speed and be like, oh, I need to be going race pace. But there's so many factors that affect how how fast you're going. Um, If it's windy, if there's hills, if it's 110 degrees, if it, you know, it's whatever. So to have a concrete number that is telling you the work that you're doing, regardless of the condition. Yeah, it's it's a constant. Mm -hmm. Yeah. All right. Before we get to Kona, what kind of power (laughs) setup do you have for people who are looking to get power? What did you get? Um, so I have power tap and it was, so you can, you can basically like put it on any wheel. There's a company called wheelbuilder.com. Um, and they, they can build you a wheel with power in it. Or if you have an existing wheel, you can ship it to them. They'll put the power on and ship it back to you. And that's what I did. Um, I shipped my wheel. They added the power and sent it back to me. And then did that hook up to a watch that you had or? It connects. Um, well, I just train with Garmin. So um, it connects with like your standard 920 or 910, any of the bike computers, 510, 520, 820. And is that the same watch that you run, that you run with? Mm-hmm. Yep. So it's all right there for yeah. you. Yeah. Yeah. There's so many options out there and yeah. it's good for our listeners to know it, when they want to move into it, that they have plenty of options. Oh, yeah. There's and, so yeah. many options now. There is, are. It really crazy. depends on the setup you want and how much money you have to spend. Exactly. Right? Yep. Okay. Great. All right. Let's talk about Kona. <laughs> and it, that's funny because the door, the doors the just door bell open. Just rang. Yes. <laughs> Cadence Running Company is open for business. <laughs> is this the man? This is him. Hey, Dan. <laughs> What's happening? Look you? at you. <laughs> Oh, it's game day. It's we're, all- <laughs> we're decked out in Ohio State. <laughs> <laughs> all right. We're just about to get to the good stuff, man. We're talking about Kona. So you were in Kona. You were right. Like, you had a nice little vacay. Let's talk about that. Yeah. Well, so I asked, <laughs> um, I asked Hillary, when we were getting ready to make, like, reservations and stuff in December, I asked her, I was like, when do you want me on the island? And she said, I want you there on Friday, September 30th. And I was like, well, that is a very direct answer. And so I'm going to book for Friday, September 30th. (laughs) Like, clearly she has this dialed in. 
So yeah, I was there a full week before the nice. race. So. Just feel like just like feeling the energy, feeling the course. And you kind of had some some things that you had to move through, like yeah. some fear about the wind yes. and stuff like that. So what was your prep looking like leading up to the race day? Um, so that first weekend was really the only like hard workout that I had um, that whole week. And that Saturday I rode, it was, uh, it was about a 55 mile ride. Uh, we rode from the Monolani up to Javi and back. And that's the only part of the course I'd never ridden before. And that is the part of the course that has the notorious crosswinds. And so she really wanted me to see that prior to race day. And uh, what are those crosswinds like? Oh, my gosh. (laughs) (laughs) So there was like some kind of freak storm that had blown in that weekend. And um, so Alyssa, who is another coach on Team HPB as well as a pro triathlete, um, she got to Sherpa me (laughs) for this run. So she like sat behind me and like gave me some pointers and whatnot. Um, And thank God for her because she is, she's so calm and she knows, she knows my fear. She's ridden with me multiple times before and she was able to just like, you know, calm me down as best as. Yeah. And really on the way up, it was windy and there was some blasts, but you're climbing. So it's completely different. Like you're getting blown a little bit, but it's okay. Coming back down was absolutely terrifying um, because you're going, I mean, I don't, I actually don't have speed on my Garmin setup. I don't look at speed, so I don't know exactly how fast we were going, but I imagine we were going probably somewhere around 30 miles an hour coming down the hill. And then you're just being pounded with these gusts of wind that, and you know, it's not race day. The road is open to traffic. Thankfully, there's a wide shoulder that you're biking on. But if you've seen the video, I mean, on race day, they're being blown Mm -hmm. halfway across the road. So I was just like unprepared for that. (laughs) Was there a moment where you felt your mind being like, oh, my God, I'm going to be killed on race day? Oh, yes. And how do you pull yourself back from that? Well, ironically, okay, this is kind of funny. So I I do have a good friend that raced. Um, Hawaii a couple of years ago and she actually did get blown off of her bike Um, it wasn't serious she got a bunch of road rash but she was able to finish the race but I was like this actually like can Mm -hmm. happen like I can be blown (laughs) off my bike but then at the same time I was like sister Madonna has finished Kona like if sister Madonna can ride to Javi and back so can I yeah (laughs) and her brown Who's like 80. Her brown, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Like there is, and, and like literally, like I, I did the math, like 40,000 people. If you if you figure 40 years, average 1,000 people per year, which right now it's more like 3,000, but um, 40,000 people have finished this race. Right. So there is absolutely no reason that I can't. Perfect. All right. So you're on the sacred ground <laughs> of the big island and... Um, What's race more? What's the night before the race like? I'm going to actually start with the morning before race day. So Friday morning, I'd had a couple of like short, just like shakeout runs that I had to do, shakeout bikes. Um, And I just never, like it never worked out for me to go to the energy lab and do it. And for some reason, like that was really important to me. I really wanted to see the energy lab before race day. And I've, I raced the Kona marathon in 2005. Um, so I've actually run the exact course. You just don't do it as two out and backs. So you do it as one um, out and back. But I, I didn't remember like the energy lab being a really big deal. And when you hear people talk about Kona, you hear people talk about how hot it is and how oppressive. And like, I was like, I kind of need to see this. Well, and it's so much later in the day than it yeah, would be if for you were a doing the marathon. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, yeah. Because so yeah, I time was, to bake. I was probably in the energy lab at like eight a.m. as opposed to like four in the afternoon. Yeah, hottest part of the day. Yeah, my best friend picked me up super early and drove me out. We couldn't um, drive or bike in the energy lab during race week, um, so she dropped me off at the top on the Queen K, um, and I just had a twenty-minute jog. So I ran down it was raining just a little bit and the sun was coming up but it was so quiet and like all you hear is literally the sound of your own footsteps Mm. and breathing and it was just peaceful 
and um, I got to the bottom and like right at a mile, um, the road turns and keeps going. But straight ahead of you is this little beach and there's a picnic table and some trees and it's quiet and the sun's coming up behind me. Um, And I just sat down for a few minutes and just like sat and just kind of took it all in. And I talked to God or Madame Pele or whoever was listening. And I was just like, I will give everything of me, not, not just physically, but everything. I will give my whole heart to this race in exchange for a safe passage. That's all that I wanted. I just wanted to get to the finish line in one piece <laughs> and just sat there and just appreciated everything that it had taken to get to this point, honored that journey and Then I ran back and we went and got on our bikes and did a little bike ride. But it was, there was nobody else out. It was kind of raining that morning. So a lot of people were waiting to do stuff until it stopped raining. And we pretty much had like the road to ourselves. And it was just really nice. Yeah, and that that moment that you had was so beautiful. It was all for you. Yeah, for sure. That's awesome. I feel like I've like been on the verge of crying this whole freaking interview. (laughs) Chills. As as you, as you're talking, chills are like... (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> okay so uh yeah the night before i mean it's getting it's getting yeah. closer and closer and like your dream that you've dreamed about and, and worked so hard and 20 ironmans yeah it's now the night before yeah and i um i carried that like sense of peace all day uh, my family was there and so we went and had dinner and got all my stuff ready and I was ready to go. And it just felt like really calm and at peace. And when we got into bed and turned out the lights that night, Dan just started talking. And I don't remember exactly what he said, but he was just trying to give me some words of encouragement. And I started to like feel like a little bit anxious. (laughs) And I was like, okay, like I just, I need to go to sleep. Like I need to go to sleep while I still feel calm (laughs) about this. (laughs) And so the alarm goes off in the morning. And what's your first yeah. thought? Um, I need to eat something. And I, I, <laughs> I like, so I know that inevitably on race morning, like there's going to come a point when I can't put anything else into my mouth because I want to throw up. So that's like my first, like when the alarm goes off, it's like I have to eat as much as I can before that feeling sets in. Um, so I ate some breakfast <laughs> and just got ready. And um, yeah, sure enough, like half an hour, I was like, just stomach yeah yeah. I was like I wanted to throw up (laughs) what did the breakfast look like what what is your Um, morning breakfast (laughs) it's a pretty standard or is it like whatever Uh, you see in sight yeah we didn't have we were in just like a little condo so we did have a fridge but we didn't have like anywhere to like cook so I think I had some oatmeal um I might have had some pop tarts actually I know I had those in in the hotel room, but I can't remember if I ate them on race morning. I may have had a Pop-Tart, and I probably had a, an Ultra Gin shake. <laughs> I love it. That's awesome. And a banana. I think I ate at least two bananas before the race start. <laughs> so not a, not a lot of like, I must have this, and these are the exact quantities of what... Like, no. you just woke up, and you were like, I know mm-hmm. myself, and I need to get nutrition Ooh, into yeah. my body yeah. right now. It was, it was more important to get the calories in, and I mean, I'm pretty lucky um, because I don't have a lot of... Uh, sensitive stomach issues. When I'm here and racing at home, I do have like a pretty set breakfast that I eat, but I'm flexible. So you're so lucky. You're so lucky. <laughs> so Dan, um, Dan was doing some, you know, live video um, that morning, and there's a live video that he took of you guys walking down to race day, and you're like, you're smiling. This is probably when you wanted to throw up. You're smiling, <gasps> but you're a little deer in the headlights, and you're yes. kind of like, do we really have to go live right now? Like, like, so <laughs> what, what was that walk like down to uh, transition? Take us, you know, it just. Like keep taking us through yeah, the keep, day, yeah. and then we'll interject if we if we feel like that would be so important today. <laughs> um, so we were staying like a mile from the pier, right on Ali'i Drive. So transition open at four forty five. There's there's actually like unlike a normal Ironman, you don't get to just like do whatever you want on race morning. There's like a, a procession. You have to do things in order, and obviously, if you get there later, you're in line. 
So I was like, I don't need that stress. I'm going to just leave. We're going to leave at 430. I'm going to be down there at 445. And then I don't even have to like worry about having enough time. So we left. It's like dark. The sun doesn't come up until like well after six o'clock. So um, we're just walking down Ali'i Drive and there's a lot of other athletes um, obviously walking down with us and the road kind of bends a little bit. And when we made that turn and the finish line came into view, it was like I just immediately like burst into tears. And I think it was just accumulation of just that knowledge that like it it was right there. It, it's right there. <laughs> like it's there. I can touch it. But I still had 140.6 miles to go and anything can happen on race day. I know that. And I just didn't want anything coming in the way of that goal being accomplished. So how do you, how do you, how do you manage that? Like what, what's your, what's a game plan that would keep you moving forward and out of the fear that something may happen? You mean during the race or before? Just in, in, any, in that moment, even in that moment, looking at it and thinking about everything you had to do to get there. Yeah. Well, one, one very positive was as soon as I started crying, like the, the nausea instantly went away. <laughs> like, I don't know what hormones are released when you cry, <laughs> but whatever it was, like completely overrode that nausea. And so like instantly I was like, oh my God, I feel better. I might eat another banana. Um, and I saw my best friend had gotten down there early to get a spot on the wall to watch the swim. And so as I'm like bawling, she sees me walking by and hollers my name. And I look over and I'm crying. And then she sees me crying. And then she starts crying. <laughs> but she's on the other side of the fence. So I can't even hug her. <laughs> so in that moment, that's what took care of it. She's yeah. crying made you feel better. It did. It, yeah. You know, it made me feel a lot better. Yeah. And I... Honestly, like after we got past the finish line, I had that like my, my sense of like peace and, and joy about it came back and I was so excited. I mean, I was still crying, but I was like, it was like happy tears at that point. Like I was just like felt so lucky to be able to be there doing what I had wanted to do for so long. Yeah. It's amazing when we get to to those points in our life and so tell us about the swim, entering in at <gasps> Digme Beach and swimming out to tread. <laughs> it was cool. So the the get it, you get in and you like swim out and they have this like row of kayakers and they're literally in a line rowing. They're like laying belly down on the surfboards and so they're paddling and they're literally going back and forth in this long line in front of you so that nobody can like creep up on the start line. They're just like keeping you behind the buoys right before the cannon's going to sound. They just like disperse and you know that like it's coming. Oh my gosh. <laughs> and how did you position yourself? I went like far left. Uh, I wasn't like the absolute most left person. There was, you know, a couple dozen women to my left, but the vast majority of the field was to the right. Yeah, um, hugging the pier. Hugging, and... hugging the pier and the buoys. And and I, I had a fear because Dan had told me, and you hear stories in Kona, unlike a normal Ironman swim, they actually, the kayak, kayakers are next to you and they actually keep you pretty tightly together in the swim. And so like literally you can't swim out. And I didn't know, like, how much space we were actually going to have. Like, I imagined we were all going to be, like, packed in together. And, and no matter what, like, I was going to be hitting people. In reality, we actually had tons of space until we caught the men. But it was just... Because that's what you do when you swim that fast at Kona. You catch the boys. <laughs> yes. <laughs> um, but it was, the, it was really... That... The swim, I think, was the highlight, one of the highlights for the day, for sure, because I don't usually get to swim with strong women. And so when the cannon sounded and, like, literally left and right, every time I breathed, it was just this wall of pink caps just, like, turboing the through the water. The best of the best. It was amazing. And I felt that way the whole day, the best of the best. I felt that way the whole day because you're just, like, surrounded by just incredible talent. 
Yeah, that's so cool. So did the swim go by super fast? It did. <laughs> um, I was actually shocked when I got out of my water. Uh, I got out of the water and I looked at my watch and it was like an hour um, because I Kona I think is is a slow swim just based off of my husband's experience there and um, other friends that we know that have raced. It just seems like the times are a little bit slower than like a normal Ironman. And part of that is no wetsuit. And I was like, just beyond excited when I got out and it was like an hour straight up. I was like, yes. (laughs) (laughs) I thought if I swam under 110, I would be doing good. (laughs) So you go through transition is the, is the, in the transition is just, it's just massive and it's such, it's always like that kind of same setup and you run all the way along. Long run. Yeah. Long (laughs) run. And then you get on the bike and, and what's that like leaving like the pier. riding, uh, yeah, <laughs> leaving the pier and getting on your bike. And were you just reminding yourself all day, like, oh my God, this is what I dreamed of? Yeah. Like, I mean, I'm I living literally it. had a smile on my face the entire yeah. day. And there were so many, like, right when you come out of transition, you like go around the block before you um, climb up the hill and do the out and back on um, Kuakini. But in that like half mile stretch where you ride around the block, there are so many people. And just they're screaming and they're excited and you're like, oh, my God, I'm so excited. And it was just it was amazing. It was like the perfect start to the bike course. <laughs> so did you have fear? Like, were you thinking about those crosswinds? Well, I, I had hope. I, I didn't think about it um, during the, the early parts of the bike because I just you can't you have to stay in the moment. You can't like worry about what's ahead. And I knew that the storm that had been there the week before was gone um, I thought we would still have probably some pretty bad winds, but I, I hoped that it wasn't going to be anything like the week before. Um, as it turned out, we had pretty strong headwinds, but I never felt I never felt scared in the crosswinds. Yeah, those crosswinds, that's when you start with yeah. the, the, you know, the wheel starts to go. And yeah, yeah it's, it, it can be super scary. So how did your bike go as a whole? Um, I was really happy with it. Nutrition, good. Yeah. So the cool thing was the aid stations were more like every five to seven miles. Oh. And so it worked out perfectly because I didn't even have to like take in nutrition outside of the aid station. I literally would, as I was approaching the aid station, I would sit up, I would take a huge drink of my nutrition, um, and then I would grab a water bottle, chase it. I would grab another water bottle and absolutely like cover myself Mm -hmm. with cold water and then keep going. And I had a little, um, I had my arrow bottle with water. It's like if I needed to sip in between aid stations, it was there. But yeah, I never had to like reach for food outside of an aid station, which is, I think if you can just stay arrow as long as possible, it's better. (laughs) (laughs) And did you practice that on the trainer? Because you know you said you did a lot of trainer rides, like practicing just being arrow on that trainer. There is a lot in arrow on the trainer, but we also did a lot of um, Ironman specific. Like my long rides were like four hours. Generally, I might have had like one five hour ride. We don't do a lot over four hours on the bike. It's just really focused. But there would be you're just like an arrow the entire time. Yeah, yeah, it's so important. It's so important to you know a lot of people are like. They train on their road bikes, but I think it's so important to get on your race bike yes. and really, really feel that arrow. So you were talking about nutrition. What kind of nutrition are you taking in on the bike? Um, so I use PhD. I think it's glycodurance is the formula that I use. And a friend of mine had suggested it because I had some nutrition problems in 2014. And so she had suggested that to me. So I started using it in 2015 and it seemed to work really well. Um, and it was certainly a heck of a lot easier than, you know, trying to eat solid food while you're working hard. So it's just all liquid. You get all <laughs> no your solid. calories yeah. from liquid. Yeah. I mean, I take a few gels, but it's still liquid. Mm-hmm. Yeah. I can't, w- when I'm working hard, I can't like chew and chew and breathe at the same time. <laughs> <laughs> so for me, that's what works better. All right, cool. Well, we'll link up to that so everybody knows what it is. So take us from the uh, the bike into the run. So when I got off the bike, I was like, that, that probably was like the least clear headed I was all day. I was just like, you know, you're exhausted. I had been fighting a headwind for like 35 miles. Uh, I was tired. I was ready to be off the bike. And a friend of mine actually was like the bike catcher there. And she 
like I looked at her and like I knew that it was Heather, <laughs> but at the same time, like I couldn't like I couldn't be like, oh hey, great to see you. It was like I'm gonna hand you my bike, and there's something wrong with my toe. My toe really hurts, and she's she's like how can I help you with your toe? And I'm like, I'm like hobbling through transition because I don't know if I had been like squeezing my toes in the bottom of my bike shoes, just like in the effort. But like, I swear I had a broken toe. <laughs> I was like, I can't even walk. How am I going to run? But <laughs> the minute I put my run shoes on and like jumped up, it was like totally fine. I didn't even think about it again. So, you know, you come out of transition in that first mile, you like run up, Polani, run around the corner and come back down onto Ali'i Drive for like a 10 mile out and back. And in that first couple of miles, there are just like so many people. That's where all the restaurants and bars and stuff are. So there's just like a ton of people just hanging out there and cheering. And that's where I got to see my family for the first time. And it was just so much fun. <laughs> they were all there. And I gave my best friend a big hug and I kissed Dan and I was like high fiving people. And it was just like, you were soaking up the experience. Yes. It sounds yeah. Like, yeah. Really. Celebrating safe passage mm-hmm. through yes. the swim and the bike. Like, I felt home free. I was like, the bike is done. Like, mm-hmm. I have all night. No matter what happens, like, I am going to be at the finish line. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So you weren't like, oh, I have to do this in no. a certain amount of time. You were just soaking it up. This is what you had been waiting for for so long. Yes. <laughs> so um, how was that energy lab that everybody talks about? It was amazing, actually. <laughs> so when I got there... It had been like it it was still daylight, but the sun was starting to go down and it's so quiet down there. Once you get out, once you leave Ali'i Drive, um, so like mile 11, you're on the Queen K and then you do the energy lab and then you turn back and you're on the Queen K till the finish. And once you get out on the Queen K, it is really quiet because there's nothing out there except for the aid stations. And they don't allow any vehicles or spectators or... No, I mean, there were a few spectators scattered, like, here and there, just, like, they had probably, like, borrowed a bike or something and, like, ridden out there or or driven. I mean, I think there's, like, some back roads. But other than, like, pockets of, like, a couple people here and there, it was just, like, you and the other athletes. And when I turned into the energy lab and you just, like, have this incredible view of the ocean and it's quiet and it's just, like, so peaceful and... Uh, it was beautiful and you'd like run down and you, I think it's like, I think you're in the energy lab for maybe a total of three miles on the way back out, like literally the last aid station before you leave the, the energy lab, I was like running up and there's a volunteer there with a cup out. And I'm like, do you have chicken broth? And the guy was like, no, I have water. And I was like, Oh my God, you're Peter Reed. <laughs> <laughs> and he looks at me like, what the hell is this woman going to do? <laughs> He's like, Crazed yes. fan, crazy yeah, fan. Yeah, exactly. He was like, "Yes, I am. Keep running." <laughs> <laughs> so I was like, "Oh my god, Peter Reed just handed me water." <laughs> a champion of the. I race. know. I was like a huge fan of his back in the day, so it was like so cool to see him out there. <laughs> That's awesome. Um, and then I got back out onto the um, to the Queen K, and I kept looking because you're you're obviously you're like two way traffic. So I kept looking. Um, a friend of mine. Um, Scott, we have literally done like nearly every Ironman race together. So I knew that he was going to be like getting to the energy lab at sunset. And I just like, couldn't wait to like, just be like, go enjoy it. It's amazing. (laughs) That's so cool. I don't, I'm not sure everybody would explain it that way describe it that <laughs> yeah, way yeah usually they, they go in and have a tough time coming out but i think that's the difference between you and like um a more pessimistic attitude like you just seem to really pull out even though there was times where you hit low you know yeah. like after tahoe and before arizona like you pulled so much good out of that yeah you know and when you talk about something like the natural energy lab there's so much power there that you can use to your advantage and you can feed right it's there it's being offered to you or you can let it be a heavy weight on your back exactly and we always have a choice we always have a choice so you come out of the energy lab and you're heading yeah and I was I was like literally practically doing cartwheels I was like (laughs) oh my god we have five miles in a victory lab I was like so excited and people around me I'm like people are like suffering I mean everybody's running there was nobody walking the marathon everybody's like running but um you can tell like people are not necessarily feeling as great as I'm feeling <laughs> I'm like come on you guys we've got like six miles um and I 
so, so yeah, it was just like every aid station was like, oh my God, I have one less mile. Oh my God, I have one less mile. And it was like, and then I could see the, the, the base, um, salt tent was like right at the top of Polani. And so when that comes into view and you're like, I literally have a mile left to run and you can, at that point you can hear the music and you can hear the finish line and there are crowds lining the course the rest of the way. And it's dark. I know a lot of people like, they're like, I want to finish in the daylight. And I, maybe that's like a badge of honor because it's like faster time or whatever, but it was like finishing in the dark and, and the glow of the lights. And, um, you you don't see, you don't see like a lot of faces, but you just like hear voices and you can just like soak in like all of the other, um, senses, I guess. Um, just like take that all in. Mm -hmm. (laughs) And you're pulling from the energy from all these people. Yeah. That was like my fastest mile. So I, (laughs) I, you know, coming out of transition, I like settled in to like a 10 minute pace and I was like, well, this is comfortable. I'm just going to like run this pace. And I think my last mile was like an eight minute pace. (laughs) I mean, granted it's like all downhill, but, but yeah, I was definitely feeding off the crowds. (laughs) And what was the finish line like, like coming down that, what I've heard about, the finish shoot in Kona is that it's it's not two people deep or three people deep. It's like ten people deep, like out from the rails. Oh, like there's yeah. just so many, many people. people there. Yeah. And they do set up bleachers on one side, um, which you know helps a little bit. <laughs> but yeah, there's just like so many people. And ev- you can just like see like th- and the crowd. The crowd is feeding off of you. And I don't know if you've ever like experienced this when you're racing, but when you give them positive oh. energy, mm-hmm. you get that back tenfold. If you like raise your arms up yeah. or put your hand out or for a high, high five, fives. like yeah. you're going to get that back. Yeah. Like a unbelievable amount of energy is going to be offered to yeah. you. Yeah. And just like, yeah. I mean. It's so fun. It's I, so fun. Yeah. You're on stage. You are. You mm-hmm. are. But you know, it's a. For the spectators, it's a really long day. I hate spectating, actually. Um, it's tougher than the Iron it's, Man. It's harder than Iron mm-hmm. Man. And, and I think a lot of that is because your day starts at 3 a.m. And when your athlete finishes, your day is not over yet because you still have to take care of them. Mm-hmm. <laughs> so in a lot of and, and you're dehydrated and you haven't eaten all day and it's miserable. Oh, totally so like, dehydrated, <laughs> like undernourished. Yeah, it's the hardest. It's so hard. Yeah. It's so hard. So tell us about the – like what – how are you feeling coming down that finish shoot? I just felt amazing. And you can see, I mean, again, like when you make that turn in that the bend in the road on Ali Drive and you just like see the finish line and, you know, the drums and the the entertainment that's going on and the torches that are lit. And it's just the finish line that you had seen so many hours yeah. before. <laughs> yeah, same one. <laughs> Only this time it was like lit up like mm-hmm. You crossed the finish line. Yep. And what did that mean to you? It was a little bit surreal, like, at that very second. Like, I was, like, a little bit choked up for sure, still smiling. Um, But when I came – so they have, like, a little ramp that goes up and over. Um, When I came down the ramp, I heard my name, and I turned, and my entire family had gotten, like, front row right on the fence. And it was, like – in a spot that I could get to them. And so I like instantly like ran over there and I hugged my mom. And I mean, it was like, it was just like finishing Ironman Arizona, hugging Hillary, only it was like me and my mom and we were like bawling and my sisters and my best friend. And we all, I mean, just like having that moment with them, that was most meaningful. Mm. That's so beautiful. What makes Kona so special? For me, it was just, it was the goal. It was setting the goal and putting in the work and then achieving that. And it, it didn't, it didn't have to be the world championships. It didn't have to be in Hawaii. I just think that for me, it was so special because it was something that I had to work for. Didn't come easy. And that's what that's what made it special on that. If you could share with our audience what it takes for the, for, and for everyone, it's different, but it sounds like, it sounds like you are truly committed and you truly put the work in there. If there's somebody out there who has a similar dream, yeah. what can you say to them? 
you know, honestly, like it all comes down to sacrifice. And what are you willing to give to make that dream come true? And there were a lot of sacrifices made. Thankfully, my husband, as I've said, does the sport with me. And so I, I didn't feel like I was sacrificing our time together, our relationship. I don't have kids, so I'm not neglecting my children. But it was sacrificing all the little things. Like we would get invited to go places and it's like, oh, I can't go because I have to be up at 4 a.m. And, you know, at some point, like you turn down enough invitations and you're like, oh, now I'm just not getting invited anymore. Yeah, you don't get We haven't been invited places for many years. Yeah. And it was like, you know, I was okay with that. I mean, my friends um, who are closest to me, they understood and whatever – Basically, we just you, you learn to value what time you do have. Yeah. And literally every minute of my day is spoken for. I worked very, very closely with my physical therapist, um, staying on top of everything. I have a friend who does uh, myofascial stretching, and she works on me every every two weeks religiously. I recognized that my diet was probably holding me back um, because I didn't have enough time. And when you don't have enough time, you're just like scrounging for mm-hmm. food. And a lot of t- for, for me, it was unhealthy choices. And so at the beginning of 25th, at the, yeah, at the beginning of the year last year, I was like, this needs to change. And so just like being willing to do whatever it takes. So Kona's no joke. Like (laughs) if you want to go to Kona, so this is important. I think this is important. Like you need to commit and be all in, yeah, in every aspect of your life. And it sounds like you've had that support system, Mm -hmm. but you've also personally accepted the challenge, yes, and done everything you could physically, mentally, nutrition wise, and that's what it takes. And a little bit of luck, like a little bit, yeah. Of luck. You need everything to be working towards you. And if you have that right attitude, you're creating the energy that's going to help you push over that final hurdle. So I think that's what what happened. And it's a, it's a good, it's a great story. Yeah. And actually what you just said reminded me, the one thing I didn't mention was the the mental game. And that is like 90% of it. Believing Mm -hmm. in yourself and believing that you can achieve the goal and I have read probably every self-help book on the planet. <laughs> um, but there's a, an author, Jim something, I can't think of his last name right now, but his book is Gold Medal Mind. And I read that last year. And he works with athletes. He's worked with a lot of Olympians, a lot of champions, and just talking about mental strategies. Because, I mean, I have pretty good self-esteem and a good sense of self-worth, but that doesn't always translate into to training and racing and and having that like mm. core belief that you are good enough like truly believe like yes. you can say yeah i believe and i want to do say this it. yeah but you have to really yeah. feel that when you are in the moment and yeah. and you are suffering and you have doubts creep into your head you have to be willing to say i win wow what's next Ah. <laughs> uh, well, the big thing for next year is Ultraman. Yes, I'm glad you said that. I was saying that in the car. I'm like, I think she's thinking about Ultraman. So explain to our audience what Ultraman is. Um, so Ultraman is a three-day <laughs> stage race. So on day one, you do a 10K swim, followed by roughly a 90-mile bike ride. On day two, you have roughly a 180-mile bike ride. And then on day three, you run a double marathon, so 52.4 miles. And where does this take place? Um, well, I am actually going to be going to Australia Ooh, to race. <laughs> amazing. Yeah. And will you be working with your coach, Hillary? Biscay? Oh, absolutely. Yes. And why would you do that for Ultraman? <laughs> uh, because what? she's won Ultraman. <laughs> she, <laughs> she's won the Ultraman World Championships in Hawaii. So yeah, girl. Um, she knows exactly what she's doing. <laughs> That's amazing. I love it. And that feels like the next logical step. Yeah. You know, honestly, <laughs> like I've been waiting for, for what feels like forever. But um, I've, I have so many things that I want to do. But again, you can't do everything when you have one goal that you're working towards. And so there's so many things that I want to do. I want to run a hundred miler. I want to 
there's this like week long run in Trans Rockies in Colorado I want to do. I would love to one day hike the Appalachian tra- Trail, but you can't like do it all if you want to do the one thing. Yeah. And the one thing took all of my energy and all of my focus. Um, so trying to be a trail runner and trying to um, be a long distance swimmer while doing, you know, trying to qualify for Kona just wasn't going to work. Um, so I put all of that, all of those other like smaller dreams on the back burner. And then um, once I qualified, I was like, okay, I am going to work my ass off and I'm going to get through Kona. And then like the beast is going to be unleashed. Yeah, I <laughs> so love it. So it's like game on now. I will, I'm going to do everything. <laughs> I can't wait, wait to follow that journey. And you are such a, a shining example of a one-pointed focus, right? <laughs> like you, you have a very strong will and that's what it takes to believe in yourself and that's what it takes to get up and a four in the morning and do it day after day and keep your eye on the goal and the bigger picture. That's what it takes. And a lot of us struggle with that. But what I don't think a lot of people realize is that your will can be strengthened. So every time you choose to win Mm -hmm. over that doubt, you get stronger. Yeah. All right. I don't know. You got another question? No more questions. I just want... (laughs) I just am so inspired, and I, I use that word a lot, and I feel like it's overused. But sitting here in your presence, uh, I've only met you like once or twice, but I can just feel the energy and positivity, and the feeling that anything is truly possible. Yeah. But you need to do the work. Yes, and, and I'm so happy to know you and follow your journey and be here today. So you're just simply Thank amazing. You. So if people want to follow you as well, uh, how do they get, how do they find you? Where are you Um, on the interwebs? Well, I am Finding Kona. So my blog is findingkonablogspot.com and I'm Finding Kona on Instagram and Twitter. (laughs) Perfect. Yeah. So there's a one point of focus, you guys. She changed all her handles to get to this goal. So uh, we'll let you know if that changes to Finding Ultraman. <laughs> but um, we'll put all those links up in the show notes. And Mary, thank you so much thank for you having us you, at your running company. And Cadence Running Company. Yeah, Cadence Running Company, the best running company here in Gilbert, <laughs> Arizona. So get your butts down here and say hi to Mary and Dan. Thank you. Have you recounted it like that yet? No. You probably have you did the blog well, I did the blog. And- but- Mary not. Kona finisher, and soon to be Ultraman. So let's just get to the good stuff straight away. I checked in with Mary earlier this week, and since recording this podcast, Mary has cut down her full-time job to a part-time job, and she started coaching with Hilary Biscay's Team HPB, which she is loving. And her Ultraman training has been nothing less than epic. She is as excited as she is terrified, but overall, she's confident in her ability, and so are we. She says that her body is holding up great, but that the weight of it all has finally started to hit. Just about a week ago, she is tired, and this girl is hungry. Mary, hopefully you're not eating too many Pop-Tarts. All right, enough said. So she no longer complains about days off, which I think is an awesome shift, and she's looking forward to her taper and she's almost there. Ultraman Australia is May 13th to the 15th, and we'll be posting as much as we know about how Mary's doing that weekend. So if you want to follow along, check us out at Yogi Triathlete on Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, and also connect with Mary finding Kona. And we have all of those links in the show notes. And if you want to know what it takes to train for this three-day, 320-plus mile race, well, She shared some of her fun, as in crazy, things that she's done in her prep, including a 10-hour day on the bike, climbing Mount Lemon in Tucson, twice, riding 140 miles with an hour and a half of intervals, and then getting up the next day and riding another 100, and that was just this week. She's done a 30-mile run in the Grand Canyon. And I'd say she's absorbing it very well as she has set a new PR for herself at the 50K distance at the Pemberton Trail Run and at Oceanside 70.3, where she also landed on the podium just a few weeks ago. All the while, you guys, averaging 23K in the pool every week with regular 10K swims. Now, 
I know you crazy people, and I know some of you are drooling right now. And I know that one of those people is my husband and yogi triathlete coach, BJ. For sure, this is in his future. But if that is you, if you are drooling over this kind of intensity and dreams of Ultraman and dreams of qualifying for Kona, don't push it away. You are worthy of it. Let it marinate and give it love. Just see where it takes you. Thank you for tuning into this week's show. Mary officially wraps up our Ride the High Vibe Tour interviews, and we'll be back next week with our monthly edition of Ask the YTs. Stay tuned for all new interviews from our new home in California. We are so honored to share this life with you. If you're enjoying the show, please use the Amazon banner ad on our website. It's also in the show notes. Check out our Patreon page to become a monthly patron. Share the show with your friends and keep reaching out to us and letting us know how the show is assisting you and making positive changes in your life. And we are, you guys, I'll say it again, we are in deep thanks for your support and for every step you take in living your high vibe life. And this is what the world needs right now. It needs you. It needs you in your most honest and authentic life. And understand that by doing that, you are making a strong impact for the better in this world.